Hey, good morning, everybody. I think we're playing trickle church this morning, unless some people are out for the Daytona 500, maybe. I don't know. I think that's a thing today, right? It's like a cricket match. A cricket match with <laughs> roller, they're on, they're on roller skates. I know there's wheels involved, so it's, I think it's like a roller skating cricket match. Hey, I'm glad you guys are here. I don't know, um, I don't know where, you, where you're at uh, uh, today, probably between the A and the T, because you're not supposed to end a sentence in a preposition. But um, I don't know if you are, if you're killing it, like if you are just rocking and rolling with life and with your relationship with God and people, and it's, you're just like as close to shalom as you've ever been, or if you are barely hanging on um, to your sanity, to your faith, or somewhere in between. Um, but man... God has given us a gift in each other, a place where we can come here and be safe, wherever we are, wherever you are in your walk today. And so I I pray that the Holy Spirit of peace and of comfort and of joy and celebration would just overwhelm each of us today. Remember, that lament, lament is praise. When you look at the world and you say, I hate this, chances are God hates it too. And you are celebrating God's identity as one who is good and wants good for his world. So if you need to lament, lament. If you are stoked and you're here to praise, praise. And, uh, but, but whatever we do, let's take every thought captive and let's, let's not be here for a religious service. Let's not be here. Um, let's be here together under the Lordship of Christ as his body to recalibrate <laughs> whatever our lives have been lately, to recalibrate them in the light of of the kingdom of God that's at hand. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you that you are you, that there's nothing that can budge you, that there's nothing that can budge your truth, what you say about who we are, about what you say about um, who you are, about what you say about um, what our lives are about, that, that, that you are a pillar, an anchor, an unmoving source of life and hope and resurrection of redemption. And so, Father, let us uh, uh, hold to you um, in whatever circumstance we find ourselves this morning. We love you. As we sing these songs together as one body, singing the same words together, we pray that the unity of our, of our words, of our melodies, that they would reflect our desire and our practice to be united as your body for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.
this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God. 
God is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Thank you, Lord. There's nothing worth more that can ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. and see of the greatest love and my heart becomes clean and free and my shame is undone let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness become more aware of your presence. Experience the glory of your goodness. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your whole Amen. Hey, I want to make a deal with you. You want to play Let's Make a Deal? Here's the deal I'll make with you. Is first of all, we'll acknowledge that you are all really messed up. More messed up, that you're all more messed up than you'd really want anybody to know. Good. That's the deal I wanted to make. Just kidding. And then we'll make the, the same, the same, the deal, the same thing is true about me. Right. And so then that means we've got to recalibrate what we're doing at this point in the service. Right. What we just did was we didn't come here to sing a bunch of emotional songs to get fired up so that you can listen to the holiest, smartest guy in the room tell you what you need to know about God. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that's what church is about. So, um, and I don't want to knock church. I like church. <laughs> I'm here. Um, but what we're, what we're doing today is, is, is we're stepping into a relationship together. That God, by, by, by God's grace, we'll hear from God together. That God will protect you from me, from whatever I understand poorly or would communicate poorly. That God would protect you from you, from whatever um, 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 uh, uh, like ditches in your brain that you have that make you hear things that aren't really said. You know what I'm saying? And that, that by God's grace, the Holy Spirit would be like this translator, you know, like the Holy Spirit who helped the disciples speak in languages that they didn't know at Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit would communicate between God's heart and my heart and, and between my mouth and, and, and your spirit. And, and then together we discern something from Yahweh, which is crazy. Deal? 
Awesome. Man, I'm really excited about this series that I'm that we're, we're going through. You know, you if you ever want to feel like a hypocrite, become a pastor. If you ever want to feel like a huge hypocrite, become a pastor and preach on how to do relationships well. We're in our series going through uh, relationships, and, 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 and I titled it Relationship Status Messy and Beautiful. And we have this great, timely graphic of Facebook, because Facebook is super new and fresh. And Anyway, um, um, but I'm really excited, and, 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 and you know, we've gone through some of this stuff before. Some of it's going to be a re-performance, but you know, this is like, like, like grace. This stuff needs to be gone over again and again and again and again and again so that it becomes like a part, like muscle memory in our souls and our psyches, that this is how we relate with people. And, and um, so um, what we're doing is, 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 is we're having like four or five sermons on this. We're having two Wednesday breakout sessions with Dr. Sarah Kappen, who, who takes us kind of through like a, 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 like a process group. And we met last Wednesday, and it was great. If you want to look at the handout that she gave, and I think there's a few more left on the communion table back there. And uh, if you can make it this Wednesday at 6.30, I super encourage you to do that. And then March 1st and 2nd, Dr. Hud McWilliams will be back in town, and he's going to lead us through on Tuesday and Wednesday night at 6.30, lead us through some things. I think he's going to talk on emotional intelligence. And um, I, I hope you see... You know, there, there, there are some weird schools of thought out there. Some schools of thought say, you know, don't listen to psychology. Psychology's the devil. Only listen to the Bible. And then there's some people out there that says, hey, man, don't listen to that ancient, you know, religious book written by Neanderthals. Listen to, sci- listen to the science, to psychology. And then, there, and then, and then there's, there's some people who, who, who say, hey, you know what? Like, all truth is God's truth. And if there's anything true about psychology... God owns that. And we can, we can find these principles in Scripture. Let's look at Scripture and see what it might say about relationships and how it aligns with good clinical studies of how relationships operate. And it's really exciting that, that that's where Dr. Kappen resides, and that's where Dr. Um, McWilliams resides. And, and, and it's, it's, boy, it's just life. We are created for relationship. I mean, shalom, the, the, the Hebrew idea of peace, shalom, means wholeness in right relationship with yourself, right relationship with God, right relationship with others, and right relationship with creation. You know, you can have an unhealthy relationship with stuff, <laughs> like, you know, chemicals, hello, food, adrenaline. I mean, you know, it's just... It's just Having a right a shalom is whole relationships, and that's what Jesus came to give us, not just a golden ticket to hell when we die. And so, so this stuff is just, just huge, and I'm super excited about it. So, so go ahead and go to our next slide. Here's Just, just so you know, here's the, um, um, the calendar. I know the, the dates aren't marked, but um, there's, well, they are marked. <laughs> so February 13th, we're on February 20th, right? That's where we are. So we've got another cap and night um, this Wednesday. Next, Wednesday, uh, next Sunday, we'll have another sermon in the series, and then that week, we'll, March 1st and March 2nd, will be um, HUD Night 1 and 2, and then we'll wrap it up on March 6th. And uh, I'm just really excited about this stuff, guys. I, I think it's foundational uh, to being human and being a follower of Christ. Being a follower of Christ means loving God and loving people, right? So it's good to know how to do that well. <laughs> So, um, uh, go ahead to our next slide. So, last week we, we talked about differentiation and exposure, that those things are the products of good personal boundaries, and that the, all of that together is the foundation for healthy relationships. Good personal boundaries that provide an atmosphere of differentiation and exposure. Differentiation means I'm not enmeshed. Well, I think we're going to have a, a slide with that in a second. Right? We're, we're differentiated from each other, and exposure means since, since we're not enmeshed, I can, I can actually have space to share with you who I am, what's going on with me, and so you can actually get to know who I am and not the person I pretend to be to maintain this enmeshed manipulative dance of weirdness. Right? So 
Um, so, so good boundaries. We need good boundaries to know where we end and where others begin so that we can, we can have differentiation and, and exposure. Um, um, Sarah said last uh, Wednesday that, uh, Dr. Kappen, that good boundaries give us freedom. And she used the analogy of, of like, if you know where your property lines end and begin, well, that gives you freedom now. You know where you can plant your gardens, where you can build your doghouse. And, and what, I th- what I thought was that it also gives you the freedom to know what gardens you don't have to weed. Right? What roofs you don't have to repair. Now, you can, if you want to, go and help people and show love, but boundaries show us where our responsibilities begin and end, and that gives us freedom. And in Galatians, we, 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 this is not just psycho babble gobbledygook. Um, we see these principles in Scripture. Go ahead to our next slide. Galatians 6 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So we learn that we're responsible for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We cannot mind our own business with each other on some levels. We are our brother's keeper. If we're in community, we're a part of the community. We have communal responsibilities. If we refuse to come out of our walls to help each other, we have boundary problems. However, even as we move out to help others, we must maintain healthy boundaries to keep evil out. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We're responsible for our own emotional systems and actions. Go ahead to our next slide. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. In other words, we all need help. If you think you're something, when you, you, when you think that you're something when you're nothing, you deceive yourself. And, and if you don't think you ever need help in life, you are deceiving yourself. You're not all of that in a bag of chips. You're not the bomb.com. In Christ, we're all the bomb.com. Just kidding. Sorry. Um, so there are burdens in this life that none of us are meant to try and carry alone. Next slide. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. So even as we open ourselves to be helped, we must make sure that we don't take advantage of others. We are, in the end, responsible for our own actions. We should carry our own loads. And so we use the metaphor of boulders and backpacks. There are boulders in life that none of us are supposed to try and carry alone. We should not think so highly of ourselves to imagine that we can do life by ourselves. We are supposed to bear one another's burdens. But there's also a backpack full of stones that's our load to carry. No one else is supposed to carry those stones. We may be tempted to unload on others to try to give them our responsibilities. And sometimes others want to unload on us. And sometimes some of us want to sneak over and say, let me, let me help you there. Let me help you there. Let me help you there. And you're just like, ah, stop. <laughs> uh, but C.S. Lewis said, there's the type, uh, this may be sexist. I don't know. But it's, 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 if you, it's, it's funny. If, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not sexist. I don't know, he, but he said, he said there's a type of mother who lives her life for her family. And you can always tell their fa- her family by their hunted expressions. <laughs> let me help you, let me help you, let me help you, please stop. Helicopter, yeah. Sorry, my, please silence your cell phones. Jesus will not move if you don't. Uh, Yeah, no one else is supposed to carry those stones. Uh, We may be tempted to unload on others, expect them to carry our load, or because we want to feel needed, or for some other reason, we may sneak a hand in someone else's backpack to carry their stones for them. But that's actually robbing them of their identity. So Christian relationships, which in other words is human relationships, God's plan for relationships, um, we're responsible for others as much as it doesn't lead to harm to our personal God-given Christ-redeemed identities. We're responsible to open ourselves up to help others and be helped by others. And we're responsible that we don't take advantage of others as they offer to help us. And that also means we don't overreach the boundaries of others by coercing them to let us help them in unhealthy ways. And here's the diagram of boundaries. Go ahead. A good boundary keeps, lets what is true in, 
It shoots what is not true out. It keeps what is not true out and has a place to store um, what we're not sure about. We look to see what our wounds might be, where our boundaries might have breaches, where untruths can come in quickly. Uh, you know, for, for, for me, I don't know why, I'm still working on me, but I am, I'm very quick to shame. And so I know I have a, ver- a, a breach. If there's anything that I can feel shame for, there's just like this big hole in my, in my personal boundary that says, come, come and destroy my soul. Make me hate myself and be awkward around others. And, and then I'm learning to put a brace up there. And, and sometimes I put the brace up too strongly. One time somebody, we were joking, I was laughing with somebody and we were joking and they said, oh, shame on you. And I said, no, Jesus took shame off of me and you or nobody else can put it back on me. And I, I, I know, I know, I know. And I think she was like, it's just an expression, you know. So, um, so you know, we, we, you learn where your, where your breaches are, where your wounds are, and you, and you brace for that. And, and maybe not brace so much that you become a defensive jerk like your pastor. But anyway, personal boundaries, knowing where we end and where we begin. You know, and the whole skin thing is a great example. My skin is not responsible to keep germs out of your body, right? Um, um, so anyway, but skin, it, it's porous, right? It lets, lets sweat and stuff out. It, lets, it breathes. It lets, you know, vitamin D in. Like it's, and, and there's, there's places where you can put food in and blow snot out, you know? I mean, it's, it's the skin. And then we have this chart. Then we have this chart. Go ahead, next slide. Um, a summary of boundary problems. If, 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 you, if you have a boundary where you can't say no, um, that's the compliant. You feel guilt and controlled by others because you can't set boundaries. You can't say no, and so you feel like you're manipulated by others and controlled by others, but it may just be that you're not saying no when you need to say no. Draw the boundary. Um, if you can't say yes, um, then that's the non-responsive. Sets boundaries that don't show care for the needs of others. You're not willing to go and bear a burden. Um, can't hear no. The controller aggressively or manipul- manipulatively violates the boundaries of others. We had some good discussion about that on Wednesday night. Um, and the avoidant who can't hear yes sets boundaries that mean they don't receive care from others. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a bad boundary that won't let good things in. You know, if, if, a, if a cell, membrane, which is another great picture of a, of a boundary, if it won't let the good stuff in, the cell's going to die. And man, uh, our souls, we need to let the good in so that we can live. Go ahead. So yeah, bad boundaries lead to enmeshment or isolation. But isolation may be a form of enmeshment. I need to process through that. But, 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 but uh, it also leads to an inability to be honest a tendency to hide within oneself because to speak too much, to move too much, tugs on the entire enmeshed relational system. Good boundaries allow for differentiation and then exposure is possible without tugging on people's identities because your identities aren't wrapped up in each other. And so here's, I wanted to go all over that again. Sorry, I know, I know recaps are boring sometimes. But what we're talking about today is boundary disputes. Because when you start drawing boundaries in your life, when you start having healthy boundaries, and when you and your spouse or you and your fiancé or you and your children or you and any significant person in your life, when you start determining to draw boundaries together, you're going to have boundary disputes. Wait, wait, wait. No, this is my line. Uh, This is my line. Well, what are we going to do about this? The disputes are going to come up. And, 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 and it's important to emphasize this point. The presence of border disputes, the presence of tension in any relationship is not a sign of an unhealthy relationship. The presence of border disputes, the presence of tension, is actually an invitation to deeper intimacy. Tension in a relationship is an invitation to deeper intimacy. So I want to launch into, this is my, I'm most excited about this part of the sermon. We're going to look at a really fun aspect of Scripture and and, and a really fun passage of Scripture. We're going to look at Matthew 
chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. Now, eventually, <laughs> we are going to look at Matthew 17, 22, all the way through 2019, but we're going to do it in, 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 in a quick synopsis kind of way, and, and, and you're all going to be like, whoa, that's so awesome. I'm going to be like, dude, I know, and we're like, Scripture's cool, and, and it's going to be great. So, Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. Here's what Jesus said. Go ahead. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Hey, what you do on earth together with other Christians has heavenly impact. Come on, man. That's wackadoodle. What, what, what we do here, what we bind here, is bound in heaven. What we loose here is loose in heaven. Isn't that weird? What does that mean? I don't know, and we're not going to go over it today. Verse 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. That is some wicked stuff. God, who is unity, three persons, one God. He created us to be his image on earth. Unity is kind of a big, de big deal for God because it's kind of who he is. And he created us as his image. So when his image actually looks like him by being unified, heavenly, eternal things happen. Electrical currents of spiritual power are unleashed. I don't know what that really means. I just wanted to say something epic. It's nuts. I don't know what I said. <laughs> Electrical currents of spirituality is released. Is that power? I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's electrifying. It's crazy. What we bind on earth is bound in heaven. What we loose on earth is, will be loose in heaven. When his image is united in him, we effect eternity. That's some Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings stuff right there. But eternally bigger and real. That's what we're created for, man. To be united in the intimacy of the tri-unity. So, there's something super cool about the structure surrounding this passage of Scripture. This passage of Scripture is actually the center of a chiasm. Have you ever heard the term chiasm in biblical studies before? A chiasm, the Greek letter key, is an X. So when they, people say Merry Xmas, they're not trying to take Christ out of Christmas. It's, it's an abbreviation for Christ, and the Christians have been using that abbreviation for thousands of years. So I always say, let's keep the key in Christmas. <laughs> so, um, so, so a key is, 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 is the letter X. And so what... what, what um, a very uh, uh, frequent, uh, uh, normal, um, whatever, uh, pattern in biblical uh, uh, writings is, 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 is a chiasm where, where something will say statement A, statement B, statement C. And then they'll come off of that statement C and say something that parallels statement B. So it'll be like B prime. And then they'll say something that parallels statement A, A prime. And so the shape of it kind of looks like half of an X, like a key. A, B, C, B prime, A prime. And the point of that whole chiasm is usually right in the center. They're, trying to, they're, they're bringing the conversation to somewhere and then taking it back away to say, hey, this is all centered on this. And the framing language also affects the center. And so it's just this rhetorical device of ancient works. And this passage of Scripture haps, happens to be right in the center of a huge chiasm in the book of Matthew. And that's what we're going to look at real quick. Okay? So really, really quick, go here. Go to this next slide. It's a very important slide. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Can you say synoptic? I knew you could. 
Synoptic comes from, from, from sin, meaning the same, and then optic, meaning eye. So the same eye, coming from the same eye. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke come from the same eye, and John comes from the less weird eye. I don't know. Um, so, so it's been calculated that 97.2% of the words in Mark have a parallel in Matthew, and 88.4% have a parallel in Luke. Only 40.4% of Matthew and 52.9% of Luke are unique from Mark. They tell a lot of the same stories, a lot of times with the same words, sometimes in different order, lengthened, shortened, whatever, but it's kind of like they're telling the story of Jesus through the same eye. And all three of them structure the middle part of their gospel around three passion predictions by Jesus. The passion of Jesus is like the, 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 the torture and crucifixion of Jesus, right? Like, like Mel Gibson's film, The Passion, is all about that. And so Jesus has three passion predictions, and those three passion predictions show up in each of the three synoptic gospels and always in the same sort of section, in the middle section, while Jesus starts to head toward Jerusalem, and it's a section that's focused on telling the disciples who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. It comes, it comes right after Peter's confession, you are the Messiah, the Holy One. So they know he's the Messiah, but they don't understand what Messiah means. Jesus is like, you keep using that word Messiah. I don't think it means what you think it means. They think that the Messiah is going to be some kind of, 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 of anointed one, because that's what it means. King, who's going to set up an earthly kingdom in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, hey, listen, the Messiah is going to be handed over to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. They're going to beat him. They're going to mock him. They're going to spit on him. They're going to crucify him. They're going to kill him. And then on the third day, he'll rise again. And he tells them this three times. And, 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 and so this, these sections in the Synoptic Gospels are teaching the disciples what the Messiah really is and so what it means to follow him. And they all use the, those, three, those three passion predictions in unique ways bent toward their unique focus in the way that they're telling the story. Here's how Matthew does it. Here's how he uses the three passion predictions. Are you with me? Is this fun? No? It's fun for me. And I have the mic. So here's how Matthew uses the three passion predictions and this may sound a little wordy. It's, I couldn't find a better way to say it, and I just copied and pasted it out of a paper I wrote about the three passion predictions and how they're used in the three synoptic gospels. The first prediction acknowledges the disciples' new understanding of Jesus as Messiah, but also begins the journey of redefining for them what the Messiah slash Son of Man is supposed to do, namely suffer as a ransom for many. This also defines, therefore, who, who they are supposed to be as the disciples of this kind of Messiah. Jesus reveals his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration and reveals his glory in being able to rebuke the demon that the disciples could not. So Matthew demonstrates here that the Son of Man is not walking to the cross in weakness, in defeat, but in humble power. So having established the Messiah's topsy-turvy mission, of glory and humiliation. And so the call, the reflective call for the disciples to lose their lives to save it, the Messiah is not going to be, is not going to dominate and rule. He's going to die and rule. So therefore, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. You see, it, our call as disciples reflects the life and death and resurrection of Christ. So then Matthew utilizes the second and third. So the first prediction introduces all that. The second and third prediction, they kind of bookend a long section centering on the disciples' intended communal perspective. But the passage we just read, this, we have a bookend, a passion prediction and a passion, passion prediction. In the middle is this long section that all centers on Hey man, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Where two or more, two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of the mask for whatever you want, and you'll have it. So this whole section is about the unity of this. It's kind of like it's kind of like Matthew's John chapter 17. The prayer of Jesus, Father, may they all be one, even as you and I are one, so that the world may believe that you sent the Son. 
So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at this section. In the very center of the section is the passage we just read. So this, yeah. So let's, just, let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Go ahead to the next slide. Okay. I know this is a lot, but we're not going to look at all of it. There's just one super cool point I want us to see here. Matthew uses the second and third passion predictions. predictions. You see them on the top and the bottom underlined? Jesus foretells his death. Jesus foretells his death. Top and bottom. So there's kind of bookends to this section. And then the rest of it is this long chiasm. You see statement A, giving freely, money, sacrifice, challenge. And there's a parable, who should pay taxes. And then at the bottom, A prime, giving freely, a discussion of money and sacrifice, the, the, the challenge parable, labor, laborers in the vineyard. Then you see at the top, B, little children are the essence of the kingdom of heaven. And then B prime at the, at the bottom. So, so, so they, they parallel each other. You with me? And at the very center of all of this discussion about here's, what, here's who the disciple is. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be a suffering Messiah. And so here's how you follow him. This is what it means to follow him. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Center, the center of all of this is when you're united together, you affect eternity. Heaven and earth come together when my people are united in me. That's the center of it all. It's huge. So in all this time, the disciples are learning the, the, the humility, the glory of the humility of Jesus, the Messiah, and, and how to follow him, they have to take up their own cross and follow him. But then at the center of all that is when you're united in that kind of Messiah, following the Messiah that way, you bring heaven and earth together. What's super cool to me is that that centered part on unity is surrounded by discussions of tension. E talks about what to do when a brother sins. And we're actually going to read that passage. That's going to be kind of the main passage we launch off from. Um, E prime is the parable about the unforgiving servant. Remember the servant who owed his master like a million bucks and, and the master forgave him. And then he, he went to his brother who owed him like, you know, nine ninety nine, And he choked him until he went to debtor's prison. And Jesus is like, I'll soften his language. You have got to take forgiveness seriously. I'll say what Jesus said. If you don't take forgiveness seriously, you're going to be torn to pieces. That's not a threat. That's a warning. So, all this discussion about our identity, our, 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 our purpose in life of, of the unity is surrounded by, hey, you're going to have to handle tension. You're going to have to handle, you're going to have to contain the mess here, guys. If you're going to have this kind of unity, you're going to have to have a plan on how to handle tension when your brother has something against you, when your brother sins against you. You're going to have to have a plan of how to handle this. And then also, it's going to, it's going to have to be totally surrounded by forgiveness. It's going to have to be defined by forgiveness. Forgiveness and how to contain the mess. That's the only way you're going to have unity in this world. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. So let's, let's, let's look at um, uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And uh, yeah, we're going, we're going to look at some concepts from, from this passage. And I'm going to uh, give you a, 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 like a, a paradigm to process through with, and then a homework sheet, and we'll be done. Okay? Can we just go back? Yeah, we're still on the slide. Isn't that cool? No, I just, nobody's going to nerd out like me. Does anybody want to jump up and click their heels together? No? Amen. We're Baptocostal up in here. Yes, ma'am. Right. Totally, yeah. As uh, she says, uh, as uh, it's a reflection. If you fold it down, it, it would reflect each other. And that's just for the record. That's a great rhetorical device for oral cultures. You know, I know somebody who's doing some work in in orality and textuality and repetition, saying the same thing in a different way to go a little bit deeper is kind of um, 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 an aspect of of oral cultures and textuality. Yes, sir. I mean, it's pretty frequent. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you see it a lot in like the parallels of the Psalms, you know, like we were, ta- we were talking about the other day, like, you know, um, Israel will be exalted, uh, Judah will, will be named on high, Jerusalem will rise, Jacob will sing a song. You, you know, so it's like, you know, Israel, A, Judah, B, uh, Jerusalem, B prime, Jacob, uh, A prime. It's, it's, it's a lot, this is a pretty significant one. A lot of times it's more like A B B A A B C B A, but yeah, it's 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 if you just just have a afternoon if you if you have a free afternoon just Google biblical chiasms, and you'll have lots of fun. C H I A S M, chiasm. It's like a chasm, with an I. There's not an I in chasm, but there's an I in chiasm. I don't know. Okay, Matthew eighteen fifteen. So this is this is the, the the part one of the parts that surround uh, uh, our discussion of our unity and how we bring heaven and earth together in our unity in Christ. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That can't be right. Surely you're supposed to go to your friend and say, "Do you know what so and so did to me?" Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. Sarcasm. Um, if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses, refuses and listen. To, if, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I love that Jesus was honest with us. I love that he says, hey, you're going to have tribulation in this world. Like, it's, there's going to be really hard times. I love that he tells us that. And he gives us the book of Ecclesiastes to kind of put an exclamation point on that. And Job, right? And Habakkuk. Um, um, but he also tells us, man, when, you're, when we are together in his name, eternal things happen. Heaven and earth meet. But always surrounding that is going to need to be forgiveness, and a plan to contain the mess of us. Go ahead to our next slide. Tension and sin is always going to sur- surround us, and that requires a constant promotion of forgiveness and a plan for stepping into the tension as a community that leads to healing. So we're going to look at a couple of points about Jesus' plan for handling tension in the community that we just read. Uh, we're going to give us a framework to apply some of this to our own lives and then have a homework sheet. Let's go ahead to the next slide. First, notice that Jesus said, go to your brother or sister and tell them your, their fault between you and him or her alone. And man, this is huge. Especially in a system like Grace Church, where you have a tight-knit group of people always coming together to not triangulate our relationships is super important. Do you know what I'm saying? I can only have a relationship with you. I can't have a relationship uh, with you that's also uh, uh, mediated by somebody else because then I'm not having that relationship with you. And a lot of times we want to triangulate relationships for different reasons. Um, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, for example, and this is a really horrible copy and pasted image from the the Webernet. I'm sorry, but 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 go ahead. So, try one of the ways we do triangulations and why triangulation occurs when person A has a boundary that person B does not want to respect. You see, person A, and they set a boundary with person B, and person B doesn't like that. He wants to get around that boundary. So, how does person B do that? To get around the boundary, person B establishes a relationship with a third person, C, who is close to person A and uses that person to get inside with person A by proxy, hence violating the boundary. Do you ever try to get to somebody through their spouse? Through their kids? I mean, this can get really messy. It also happens, triangulation also happens when we're not willing to draw a boundary with someone. And so what we want to do is draw an imaginary boundary of an imaginary person or group of people 
so that we don't have to draw the boundary ourselves. Here's how I've experienced that as a pastor. Someone comes to me and says, hey, pastor, some people are complaining about the style of music. Some people. What I've learned in, sem- in seminary and has worked well for me so far is to reply to that and say, oh, well, that stinks. Can you give me two or three names so I can call them and talk it through with them? Because some people, a lot of times, is my wife and I. Or, you know, these two people in a Sunday school class. Or, or, or whatever. But, but it's a lot easier to try to draw a boundary with some people instead of going one-on-one and saying, hey, I'm not sure I like how this is going. Can we talk about this together in a real relationship? It also happens when we go to somebody to complain about somebody else. And the best response for this is, have you talked to them about that? Because I don't want to be drug into your problem with that person. That's called triangulation. I can't be a part of your relationship with that person. Now, it's not bad to honestly go and get counsel and advice on how to handle some things, right? But the MO should be my relationship with you, your relationship with person B or whatever, is a one-on-one relationship. Yeah? Jesus almost knew what he was talking about. If your brother sins against you, go to that person one-on-one and talk about it. That can lead to unity. If you do it humbly in the mind and spirit of Christ, even if you'd never agree on a topic, you could still love each other. Can you imagine how system, systematic unhealthiness can grow in a community when the community is defined by a series of relational triangles? This person goes to this person for this person, and this person goes to this person for that person, and this person goes to this person for this person, and then the little clicks form, and this click is going to go to this click for that click, and you can just have a systemic, unhealthy, relational reality. And it, it, is, it is constantly working against unity. Go ahead to our next slide. Then Jesus says, if one-on-one doesn't work, take one or two others so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Hey, because you know what? You know what's real here? If you think your brother or sister has trespassed against you, you might be wrong. And having an outside perspective or two can be pretty darn healthy. When it's the two of you that couldn't figure it out together, and so you ask someone together, it's not triangulating, you're on the same page here, we want to do this together, and bring in an outside perspective, and we can figure it out as a community. Because after all, where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there. Go ahead to the next slide. And finally, take it to the congregation. And if that person decides to reject the congregation, let them. Every community, like every person, needs to have healthy boundaries. This is where, who we are. This is who we're not. This is where we, we begin. This is where we end. We want you to be in here. But if you don't want to be, we're not going to pretend like you are. That's healthy. It's not mean. It actually gives them an opportunity to own their own stuff. It's, it's, it's honoring their humanity, right? Okay. I'll go ahead to our, our next slide. God's purpose for us is a unity in Christ that brings heaven and earth together, and that's not just going to happen Our time together in relationship is not going to be all rainbows and sunshine, all honey and no bees. There's going to be tension. There's going to be hurt. If we're going to experience the kind of unity that is centered in this passage, uh, it's going to be surrounded by forgiveness and intentional processes of stepping into the tension together. One-on-one, 
when necessary, with one or two outside perspectives, and when absolutely necessary, as a community willing to draw clear boundaries of communal identity. You see, we're managing the mess of us so that we can grow in unity together. Hey, it'd be great if unity just happened, but this is a sin-soaked world full of darkness. I'm a big agent of that darkness more than I want to admit. So if you're going to have unity with me, it's going to have to require lots of forgiveness on your part and a plan to handle the tension between us because I'm a mess, and you're going to need a plan to contain that mess to be in a relationship with me. And the same might be true about you. So here's a a perspective on stepping into the tension and then some homework. Go ahead. When border disputes arise, when we step into the tension, that doesn't mean fight. Man, there's a, a, a young, a couple, a little bit younger than, than, than me that got married, and for, for, for part of their wedding present, I gave them boxing gloves. I said, you need to have permission to fight. Don't sweep things under the rug. And I thought I was being, like, wise, you know, and witty. Um, but, man, we don't, just because there's tension there doesn't mean you have to fight. Instead of fighting, we can wrestle. And I'm not talking about, like, Hulk Hogan wrestling, even though that is super fun, Right? Old school Sting with the bright paint and the blonde flat top fighting Ric Flair for the world belt was a highlight of my childhood. Um, but I'm talking about Olympic wrestling, earmuffs and spandex, you know, and not, not the Steiner brothers either, but you know what I'm saying. Um, wrestling, like Olympic wrestling. Um, so here, here's the difference. Fighting, fighting is all about win or, win or losing. When you, when you get into a fight, and let's, let's have a back alley fight, your goal is to win. There's no rules, right? No holds barred. There's no time limit. The goal is to leave a rival bloodied in the dirt and to gain a place of authority, of imposed authority over them. The mindset is legalistic, egotistic, and anti-relational. This is not about me understanding you. This is about me dominating you. And we can do that with words as easily as we can do it with fists. Wrestling, on the other hand, I know this is, this is, this is a nuance, but I think, it's, I think it's super important. The goal isn't just to win or lose. There's actually a common skill set that both of you are training toward and this is an opportunity for you guys to put that skill set on display together. So it isn't just to win, but it's actually both of you working toward a common set of principles. I know we still want to win. You still want the gold medal and not the bronze. And the metaphor is not perfect, but it works. There are rules. The challengers are seen as equals. There's a weight class right? There's, there's, there's boundaries. You can't go this far. You can't have these kinds of holds, right? You can't do ninja reverse elbow strikes to the jugular. Like you, you, There are rules that you can and cannot do. Um, there's a time limit. The goal is to attain, shape, or learn a skill set that is or should be common to both challengers. I already said that, but that's, you know what I'm saying. Um, and then the mindset is open to new ideas and focused on truth and relationships, Here's what I'm so bad at and what I think is the most important thing in any wrestle is that it, if, I, if I could just make my goal to understand where the other person is coming from instead of my goal being to make sure I'm heard and understood. You know, there's this great story about, I've told it before, I think, of two people fighting over an orange. And they're about to kill each other over this orange. And a guy walked up and said, okay, look, you know, wisdom of Solomon cut the orange in half and gave them each half an orange. And they both walked away with half an orange, mad at each other, hating each other. One guy went home and peeled the orange and threw the pill away and ate the, the meat. Other person went and peeled the orange, threw the meat away, and started shaving down the, the, the peel for the, the orange icing. He was, uh, is that what you do with lime? Zest. Rind. 
So that's what you know. You know what I'm saying. Now the thing is, if they would have listened to each other, they could have both had a whole orange. And 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 <laughs> it's, it's the. I want to win, guys. I want to win. I want to be heard. I want to be respected. And when I make those my goals, I usually get none of them, and I just wound the relationship. So in order, if this is all true, and I think it is, in order to wrestle, you need to have pre-planned rules, boundaries that can help contain the mess. Normal rules are things like don't say things like you always or you make me feel. Don't name call or say hurtful things like your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries. Don't hit. Don't stick your tongue out at each other. Don't pass gas in my general direction. Uh, one, one rule guideline that helped Becca and I early on when we, we first started going through this stuff was dropping the napkin. And uh, heard this from HUD and Essentially, you actually try to carry around a napkin with you. And if you're talking, if the conversation is getting heated or if you don't think you're in a safe place to have this conversation because you might say something or, you know, whatever, then you literally just drop the napkin. And drop the napkin means the, the, the conversation stops. Everybody gets space. But whoever drops the napkin has to bring the conversation back up within 24 hours at a time where both people can agree that it's, it's a good time to talk about it. At any rate, the point is to have a set of boundaries for the two of you to step inside of and work through the issue that's bringing tension. So here's your homework. Practice container exercises. Wrestling exercises. Wrestling, wrestling, wrestling exercises. Um, if you're going to cook something, you need to have the right container or you're going to make a mess, right? If you're going to make some good, authentic Italian spaghetti, you're going to need a good jar of ragu. <laughs> Did I lose you? <laughs> Let's just say you got a jar. You're making a good, authentic college Italian spaghetti, right? And so you have a good you got a jar of ragu, and then you got a pot, Okay. Now, let's say that you've got a, I don't know what size are those, 16 ounces? Say you have a 16 ounce of, 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 of ragu and a 12 ounce pot. Pfft. Wrong container, you're going to make a mess. What if you have a 16 ounce jar and a 130 ounce pan? I don't know what that's, that's whatever, a saucepan. And you're going to burn the junk out of it, right? You need the appropriate container, otherwise you're going to make a really big mess. Um, and, and these, I have these handouts on the um, uh, table, the communion table back there. So you can grab one for your, your, yourself, your, your, your uh, group. And, and again, this is all about marriage, but it's not all about marriage. This will work for, for any relationship that you, that, that you have. So here, here's, um, here's what this says. Um, we can harness the natural growth the pressure cooker of tension and make it work for us rather than against us. We can take an approach to, to, to a relationship that is an acceptance of my own personal responsibility. Whatever conversation I have, I'm going to go into this uh, um, um, with an approach that t I'm accepting my own personal responsibility in the issue in the conversation, not trying to project your responsibility, right? And we do that by learning how to manage our own emotional system through thoughtfully confronting ourselves, responsibly communicating, finding the value of being in a relationship, and then learning to love our spouse or whoever for who they are rather than who we wish them to be. So here, I'm just going to read through this. I know it's, it's, a, it's a takeaway, but for, if you're online, email me and I can email it to you. But um, I'm just going to read through this. To, to get it, so you can get a feel of what it might look like to have these kind of rules and uh, boundaries in a wrestling match. Man, good relationships are not made of magic or chemistry. They are a product of intentionality and skill. A skill that can be practiced 
and uh, uh, improved. Container exercises are meant to be done weekly. If not, it might work poorly. The ritual and rhythm are necessary, like muscle memory for sports. They're to be, be done in a public place, not at home. That's a container in itself. I act differently in a restaurant full of people than I do at home when nobody's watching. Uh, they are to be timed, and the time is to be adhered to. Only one hour a container. Some couples even set a timer. Both of you agree to this process before you do one so that there is a shared predecision to do it. Containers should be scheduled at a time when both have available time and energy to perform. Scheduling should be done mindlessly in your calendars and adhered to as a normal part of your necessary schedule, like going to work, like eating lunch. Um, we make time, space, and money for the things we care about. At the end of people's lives, they realize they value relationships above all else and often also discover they did not dedicate the time they wish they had to those relationships. Be aware that the normal pattern of your life will fight against allowing this to become a consistent part of that pattern. The purpose is to create a safe place for wrestling with whatever issues a couple has. To begin the process, flip a coin. The winner determines who will take the first exercise. Then the couple will rotate exercises. Whoever's turn it is sets the agenda, what's to be talked about. Uh, 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 the practice of the process is actually more important than the topic. The, the, the point is this is, is to train your... Now this, is, this is Nickology, not Hudology. Doing this as a practice, like anything in life, puts ruts in your brain of how you're going to normally handle things. So when an issue pops up, maybe we'll default to this healthy way of contained wrestling instead of all-out brawl. So it doesn't matter, if, oh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, let's talk about where we set the remote control. You know, like it's, it's almost like the process, learning the process is more important than fixing issues. Because, man, you're never going to fix all the issues. As long as there's two people in a relationship, there are going to be issues. But what we are learning to do is contain the mess. Man, any creative endeavor is messy. Cook a meal without making a mess, and you are going to take too long to cook that meal. You're probably going to burn it, and it's going to be junk. Make a sculpture without making a mess. Paint a picture. Any creative endeavor is going to be messy. The goal is not to get rid of the mess, but contain it. And so that's what this is all about. Um, and the person whose turn it is sets the parameters for how the top topic will be discussed. For example, you might say, you cannot interrupt me or speak until I tell you I'm done speaking. Then you must repeat what I said in your own words so I know you understood me, stood me correctly. Then you can say what you want to say and give me an opportunity to repeat you and so on. Super helpful, super frustrating and hard to do. So the partner in charge of that specific container sets the limits of the conversation both in subject and in method. After the hour is up or the conversation is over, do something to remind yourself that there is more to life than that conversation. Ground yourselves back to reality. Go get yogurt or something. When I read that, I was like, Hud, do you really like yogurt? You know, like play or what? And he's like, he meant like frozen yogurt. Yeah. I was like, that's like, weird. Go get some play. No, we're happy. I didn't get it. Um, do what? Go, go take a walk on a beat. Yeah. Go bowling or, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, hey, man, I don't know if you're like me. I didn't grow up hearing sermons like this in church. And it's weird for me to preach them. Maybe we, we, instead we should organize a, a evangelism conference and go knock door to doors and try to get people saved. I, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't mean to be mocking. I mean, I just mean to say this is very different. But he, he, here's, here's what I think, man. The best, the best, I, I, best I got is that if we can have a healthy community, that we can really grow in building each other up to love God and love each other. I believe that healthy organisms naturally reproduce. 
Not that it's about getting seats and seats and, 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 and money and the, 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 the bins or whatever. Like, who cares about that stuff? What we care about is, 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 is growing in wholeness. And reproduction is, is part of that because, man, we love people. We want to see them love Jesus better or at all. And, 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 and so I think that this is systemic, foundational to who we are. And we have a really unique chance right here at Grace Church. We have a, a I mean, as far as I can tell, a pretty healthy body. You know, I mean, we, we're a bunch of weirdos. We're ziklag. We're goobers. We have issues. And, but we're, but we're kind of, it seems like we're kind of on the same page with grace and some of this stuff. And so we can, we can lay a foundation of, 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 of at least a, a growing toward wholeness and, 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 and maybe um, um, that'll just be an environment ripe for the Lord to add to our number daily those who are being saved. And then we might have something to offer them in the meantime when they get here. Instead of just a, yay, you're going to go to heaven and not hell. Let's go recruit some more. So that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. And that was a weird way to finish this sermon, but that's what I got. I'm going to pray for us, and the band's going to come up, lead us in a couple of songs of response. And so whatever God has said to you, reply with a yes, would you? And don't forget to take your container exercise paper and practice these things, man. Uh, this stuff doesn't happen. It takes work, and it's hard work. But, but listen, I'll close with this. You are not going to escape pain in this life. You're not going to escape physical pain in this life. Um, sometimes I'm trying to start working out again. I know you can't tell. That's okay. But I was, I was in my uh, garage, and I was lifting weights. And, boy, I got to a point where I was just really miserable, you know. And I'm just like, <gasps> I'm like oh, I can't breathe. And this was, and, and I, but I thought, it's this or it's me being overweight, unhappy, high blood pressure, heart disease. <laughs> like, eventually, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not, not just like one day, but, but we're going to have pain. The thing is, is you can choose your pain. And sometimes when you choose the right pain, it's clean pain that actually leads to a place where I'm healthy. And I don't have to have that dirty pain later on. And a lot of times couples, they just want to give up and split up because they think, hey, man, I'm tired of this. This is hard. This is painful. But you know what? Divorce is going to have its own pain. Sometimes that choosing to, to, to split up, I'm, t- I'm saying sometimes that can be the clean pain. Because staying together can have its own dirty pain. I'm just saying, we're not going to avoid the pain in this life. And so we might as well really process through what the consequences of our choices are going to be and choose the clean pain. And in this case, it means doing this relational work. Yeah? Let me pray for us. <sighs> Father, man, help us. Um, I thank you for your grace. Thank you that um, we've arrived in relationship with you. That we've arrived in your love. We've arrived in your acceptance. That there's nothing we have to do to earn anything from you. You are the gift giver. You're not the, I don't know, persuader. You're not the dangling it in front of us so we can perform to get it. Er. You've given it to us all as a gift. And so we are free. We're covered by your grace to practice this stuff. And practicing means we're going to screw it up, man. Sometimes it's big, but your grace is enough. So, man, I, I, God, give us an awareness of your grace so that we would not let the shame of the accuser hold us back from growing in our knowledge of you and our love of you and our love of each other, that we would not let the accuser and the shame hold us 
um, um, from reaching to that center of the chiasm of, of, of the identity that you have in store for us, that we would be united in your name and we would effect eternity today, that we would be the conduits that bring heaven and earth together for your glory and for our joy and that all of creation would reverberate with the glory, with the light that you spoke forth at creation, your original intended relational shalom purpose could echo and emanate out from us as we <laughs> step into the tension and contain the mess of us. Let your grace dominate. We need you. We've got you. Guide us to own that and walk in it. For your glory and our joy, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's respond to God with a yes. Bible says that the Lord is a warrior, and the Lord fights. He fights for our freedom. Mm -hmm. He doesn't fight against. He fights for, mm -hmm. and motivated by love, and it's a, um, it's a virtue that we receive, as Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. It's an ongoing mm -hmm. relationship in which we walk in and with the Lord, and he teaches us what love looks like. And when we come into this messy times of relationship, you know, the heartbeat of God is that we do wrestle, but we wrestle for people. We wrestle for the relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an awesome story that uh, I've used many times in, in, in ministry and articulating, you know, the difference of being spiritually immature and being spiritually mature when it comes to this wrestling with and wrestling for the greater good of life, of love, of victory, you know, where, where all of our energy is devoted into win-win, not win-lose. Mm -hmm. And it's a story of a samurai mm -hmm. soldier who was um, on, uh, uh, on a mission for the emperor and he was traveling down a road, and in the middle of the path was a, a monk who was sitting in the way with his eyes closed doing his monk thing. And the samurai came upon him, and he told the monk, he said, I, I want you to move out of the way. I'm a samurai soldier. I'm on a mission for the emperor. The monk didn't move, didn't bat an eye. So the samurai started to get frustrated and he got out of, got off of his horse and put his hand on his sword and said, did you not hear? I'm a samurai and I need you to move out of my way. The monk didn't move a muscle, just sat there. So the third time the samurai started to pull his sword and he said, do you not know that I have the power to put my sword through your heart? Finally, the monk, he opened up one eye and he looked up at the samurai and he said to him, do you, know, do you not know that I have the power to let you? So when Jesus calls us to turn the other cheek and he calls us to fight for people and to fight for the relationships, there's a spiritual virtue and a power released, I believe, when we surrender, when we give. And uh, building upon that, you know, I've witnessed that through the leadership of this church. Lou, many times, have de has demonstrated turning the other cheek and graciousness and my relationship with Nick also. You know, that, that our church would be a church where we fight for people and, and the greater good of God's will and we establish this unity in, in, in allowing uh, the power, as Nick was talking about, that electricity where two or more gather in his name. 
It's the opportunity, the opportunity that we have here at Grace Church through his love to see miracles happen. It's a call into the kingdom of heaven coming to earth. And uh, I'm just grateful for you guys. I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for all of those who have served here. And that we continue. We continue to serve with a heart, the heartbeat of God. So, thank you.
Amen. You may be seated. Just a few quick announcements. Um, don't forget this Wednesday, we'll keep go- keep this going on with Dr. Sarah Kappen. Um, tomorrow night, uh, Wednesday night's at 6.30. Tomorrow night at 6.30, Celebrate Recovery meets in here and then breaks into small groups. Um, Wednesday night, 6.30 is the youth group. Also, um, next week and the following week, we'll have our new members class. And so remember, this class doesn't automatically make you a member. If you're curious to know what Grace Church believes and how they operate, these two um, uh, breakout sessions will help you know that. We'll meet in our building across the alleyway there. There's a meeting room up there, and we'll, we'll, we'll meet there and um, have food provided. If you can let me know if you're going to come, that way we can have um, some food for you there. That would be great. Um, these classes do not automatically make you a member, but they are required for membership. Okay? Um, next week, um, I believe that HUD will be with us, and we're thinking about either just letting him have the mic. Um, he's kind of talking about maybe wanting to do like a little panel discussion um, with um, Dr. Kappen and me up there, and we'll see if that'll happen or not. Um, but one way or t'other, Dr. HUD will be here next week. All right? Anything I'm forgetting? Oh, offering. We should probably take an offering. So um, um, love God with your stuff. Remember, he's Lord, not just what you give, but what you keep. Sarah? So free produce next to where the snacks are. Can't email that to you guys. You're on your own. Anything else? All right. Well, hey, um, let me just say this before we, we read our blessing out of Ephesians chapter 3. Um, I'm so very grateful to be a part of this family. Um, you guys, I just want you to know that you love us, for whatever, if, you, if you care, <laughs> you love us well. Um, Becca and I um, and the kids just feel like this is family. So, uh, we're grateful to have a community to practice this stuff with. So thank you. All right. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians after calling them to uh, make known the manifold wisdom of, wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities 
in the heavenly places. It's almost like when the church is united in Christ that they bring heaven and earth together. And Paul knows we need a prayer for that. And so he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit toward your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.